Oops, I forgot my uh, I forgot my intro thingy. See, I'm getting all distracted. I've got my thoughts going. Uh, hold on a second. I'm a little out of sorts here today. Uh, where are we? How's everybody doing? Welcome. Boy, I am out of sorts. <laughs> Oh, Bella the Bayou coming up front. Legal minded friends, Karen Cole. Yeah, so we're gonna talk. Um, I have I have some interesting thoughts that I thought I would go over with you. And uh it's it's based on an old article I did that's actually in Ideas and Answers in Law. So, but I, I thought it extremely relevant for today's today's topic. I, I'm a little distracted because uh, well, I was on um, Nick's stream. I don't know if you saw the book launch party. We had a little book launch, a hard book launch on the book. And uh, that's the new book, Death Penalty Desires. And Death Penalty Desired, the PG and R version. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are making comments, that were making comments about the content of this book without reading it. You know, and I, I remember that you ever heard the saying, don't judge a book by its cover? Yeah, Lily, the stream was fun last night. I think I had a fun, you know, um, and don't judge a book by its cover. Now, obviously, I have a target market for this book, and that is the female reader who likes true crime, who likes, you know, crime, lawyer novels, sagas, romance, all of that stuff. This book is targeting that reader. It's, it's the way it came out. I mean, it's the muse speaking to me, and that's what it came out. But I, you know, People are overemphasizing the smut, the R-rated portion. The book itself, the um, the the content, should not be judged by the cover. Is that fair enough? I mean, is that too much? Is it too much to ask that somebody actually read the content before criticizing the content? I'm just, I'm positing a question. Does anybody read anymore? Is reading a thing? I mean, writing's a thing. All I do is read. Yeah, Karen, I saw you you're from England there. Good to see you. Um, so yeah, it's amazing how many people seem to think they know everything that's in this book. And I know for a fact that they haven't read it because I just mailed them out. And I know how many people have read the books. I know all the people that have ordered it off Amazon, right? It's amazing. Man, our culture is so demented. Our culture is so poisonous right now. And all I can say is I'm, I don't, I I choose not to participate in this destructive evil culture that wants to tear everybody down and destroy everybody. I, I really, that's my, my first thought is, is that um, I'm writing these things. Oh, and I, I will show you, I've got summer friend. I'm working on this cover. You see, this is the, um, the new printing. I'm, I've edited summer friend and I've done a new printing. This is a, a not for resale promo copy and see it's a little it's a little off see it's cut a little short on either ends there and the i've got to work on this i, I that, that's why you order proof copies because this proof isn't good um but i did edit some of the content and still got some of the color photos in there look at that isn't that cool yeah death penalty desires is really um it's really crazy yeah okay legal minor friends got monetized that's nice yeah, I don't know what's up with with this. Um, it's almost like I almost feel that it's the opposite. You know, you ever heard of Karen culture? Karen culture. I, I talk about this in next in my next door website that I have for our neighborhood, and you get these ladies on there. That's like there's teenagers out in the the median. There's teenagers out in the median and and they're running around in their bicycles, you know, and they somebody's got to do something. Did you see that first? You know, these like call the police on these teenagers, you know, something's outside of my normal. I want to observe out my window and get in everybody's business and tell them that they shouldn't be doing that and condemning them for what? For kids playing? When I see kids playing in my neighborhood, it makes me so happy. I love it. We have a neighbor right over across the street. And the kids dump their bikes there and they go to school and they, they get the, they, the bus parks right in front of their house. And the lady there who's a widow and her dog just died, but she's such a sweet person. And she lets the kids play in her driveway and they leave their bikes out in front. And it's like, that's wonderful. I want kids in my neighborhood too. It's wonderful. Um, oh, thank you. Like my Miami Vice, it kind of goes, this is sort of the Miami Vice theme. It is a Florida-based crime novel. Look, didn't he do a good job? Look at the, the, the trees, Grok. 
enter if you dare. I mean, I want to entice you to buy the book, right? But the content is very substantive. I'm very happy with how it came out. And this is the one you need to get. SteveGosney.com, R-rated version of Steve Gosney. That you can get it on Kindle. You can get the PG on Kindle and read for yourself before anybody comments on the contents of my books. I think they have an obligation to read them. Maybe I'm just at, maybe I'm just asking too much, but for people to like criticize what I'm selling is uh, based on the cover. I mean, it's ridiculous. I, I I don't know. It's very, very odd. Yeah, so so the, the, there's the Karen culture, right, which is this thing where people want to get around and criticize. And then there's the opposite of that, which is the male version of that, which is men who like to get off and, and, and judge others on their Christianity. They want to judge my faith, and they want to judge other people's faiths. You know what a Christian does is you you – speak the word, you live the life, you follow the way, you follow the path. You live. We live in a secular world, right? I mean, it's not, I don't live in a theocracy. I can't force anybody to do anything. I, I can lead by example. I can speak. I mean, me sitting there, like when I represent my client on death row, does that mean I endorse murder? No, my job is to advocate for my client. Um, yeah, it is slidey pie. You're right. Thank you very much. It's ridiculous when people come, but people seem to know everything that's in the book without reading it. So I don't know. Maybe they should read. Um, yeah, I, I, nobody, nobody, nobody's getting any lawsuits, that's for sure. So uh, yeah, you should do a book review, Karen. I'd be happy to do that. I'd love to have you do that. Um, yeah, so it's available on Amazon free and Kindle Unlimited. Download it and read it. I, I think it's very, it's worthwhile. Can I tell you a secret? You guys are here. You're just my friends here. I see Karen, Kathy's here, Lord of the Re, Yellow, Orange, Red. So yellow, Orange, Red, you know. You helped me write some of this stuff, right? Is it smut? I will tell you, actually, this is, I haven't revealed this to anybody today. Should I say it? Okay. Because, I mean, it, it's the book speaks for itself. But obviously, for, for those people who do not want to actually read the book, um, I will say that I think this book is also an anti-death penalty book. As much as death penalty debates, I think, weighs both sides of the thing, this is a, a look into an actual, not actual, a fake, <laughs> a fake trial and a fake crime, and it shows you the way the system works from the inside, all the way from beginning, middle to end, including death row. And if you don't, if you, I think you should read this and get an insight to the system. If you are so pro death penalty, read the book and then come back to me and say, is this the system that you feel is worthy of giving death to prosecutors and the state? That's my question. So, um, I'm just, uh, yeah, it's not, it's substantive writing with a fun and some sexy stuff. Exactly. And sex is part of our lives. It makes things interesting. That's a prime motivator. Um, yes. Thank you, Lily. Oh, and thank you for supporting the people that got their hardcovers. All the books should be out. The people that got my hardcovers, um, were my big supporters. They're the ones that allowed this book to be printed and happen. And I don't know. Um, yeah, Lord of the Re. That's <laughs> funny. So that's my first point. I want people to read the book. It's it, There is a bit of an anti-death penalty theme, I think. Now, I'm not hammering against the death penalty in any way. But what I want you to do is experience the system. Experience the system from the inside so that you understand the system that you are supporting when you say that we should empower the state with the power of life and death. Um, now, I will say that there's it doesn't if there's a bad light on certain parties within the book. I've been actually thinking about a sequel, and oh, I hate to say that. Hate to say it. You know why I hate to say it? Because I really haven't sold that many books. And most people, it doesn't seem like it's hitting the market. And I'm a terrible marketer. I need help. I'm going to have to go to my... Um, 
I'm going to have to find an agent because obviously I don't know how to sell my books. Um, but the, the sequel would be, you know, the trial of the suspect. I can't reveal the ending, but, you know, just doing the next part, right? Like what happens after this book? What happens to the parties? That would be kind of interesting follow up. And then put the black hat on some other parties that maybe got the white hat in this book. Just throwing out. Um, so that anyway, this is this is my thought. And I, I don't really know, like, be, boy, people were so hard on Nick in the chats. There were some people that were very, very mean and nasty to him. And, you know, these are, you know, even though we're on the internet, it's not television. These are human beings. And we have human beings on the end of these barbs. What is the purpose of the, the, the negativity? I, I don't really understand it the evil that's out there that makes people want to um, rip people down and tear them down. And I don't know, it, it's an odd thing. And like, I'm supposed to be, you know, telling Nick what to do when he comes to his religion and his faith. And I mean, you know, he believes what he believes. I'm not going, am I going to condemn him or lecture him or what, what, what exactly is the, is the proper thing to do as a, Catholic to, I think, how about being a friend and being positive and offering guidance and offering an example and, and following your word and, and doing that? I, I don't know. I'm just asking this for the benefit of my wonderful chat who are you're here. Um, yeah, I don't think I didn't sense friendship. I thought I thought it was very there was a lot of spite and uh, people. I, I didn't like it. And I, I think um, I like Maybe I'm just used to my friendly chat and the happy people here. So, um, okay. Well, with the, the topic for today, let me see. What other topics do I want to talk about? Oh, there's somebody talked to me about this Apple River stabbing video. And I, I sent an email to Andrew Branca because that looks to me like a good video for, for his channel. Although I would maybe wingman on, on that. So maybe we'll do a, either a joint stream or a stream over on Law of Self-Defense involving the stabbing, the Apple River stabbing. I don't know if you saw that. I guess it's in trial. I don't know. It's the first I became aware of it. I just looked at it before I came on. Maybe that was distracting me because I was thinking about it. And it maybe it's it, maybe it's related to what I'm saying here. Go, oh, Gigi, good to have you here. Um, it's related to what I'm saying here because the Apple River stabbing, if you saw that, it's a bunch of young men, kind of the Karen of the male side, and there's this, this older guy who's in the river. And, and now this is just my knee-jerk flash reaction somebody asked, right? And uh, and people, and he's in the stream. And these all these kids in these teenagers are kind of ganging up on him and hooting and hollering and shooting a camera in his face and agitating. And, uh, and, and then one of the, he, I guess he, they push him down into the, in the water and then he pulls a knife out and stabs one or more of them. I don't know, but definitely one of them kills, I guess, killed one of the, one of the kids. And then all the kids are like, Oh my God, Oh my God, what happened? Oh my God. Really? I mean, it, it, this is the, this is when you deal with murder, like I do, and you see most every murders, this is very, a great example of how murders occur. Why did this happen? Was there a grand conspiracy? Was it aliens? Was somebody plotting it for insurance money? No. Murder, 95% of the time that I've seen it, is very primal, very emotional, very reactionary. And, and these kids have no clue. You know, we should be respectful of each other. We should be kind to each other. And those kids were not kind to that man. I don't know what was going on otherwise. He was maybe being a jerk. But a little deference would have saved somebody's life in that situation, at least the way I see it. But instead, they've got to get, they've got to, what are they trying to prove here? They're trying to get all puffed up. Now, the guy shouldn't have stabbed either, but we're human beings. And that raw primal tribalism and that disrespect, that causes murder. And many lives have been inexorably altered by the actions of those stu of the stupid kids that evening and that stupid guy. I'm not taking away from the stabber either. But that situation, did anybody have enough common sense? Obviously not to look around and say, you know, maybe you should lay off each other a little bit. Maybe you should 
be kind. Whatever, whatever pissed that guy off said, sorry, sir, back it off. I'll tell you, um, I mean, I, I don't know. It's these are dangerous people are dangerous. People, every individual is capable of murder. Um, let's let's talk, let's see a few people here. Um, AJ, I needed your input on my earlier stuff. Go back and catch up because we just started. Slidey Pie, Dr Dregged in Strife, Lord of the Ree, Slidey Pie, oh, Jonathan, good folks. Uh, I'm not reading that one, but somebody who is uh, an R-rated person. <laughs> AJ, good to see you. Hey, uh, let's see. Legal-minded friends, Karen Cole, and she says she got monetized. That's pretty cool. And let's see, who else we got? Sadie Lee Lee and Murph's Turf. Uh, who else we got here? Kathy. So if people get nasty, I, I don't, you know, I'm starting to change my mind on free thought. Corn Pope's here. What happened to you, Corn Pope? Good to see you. Been a while. Nice to see you again. Um, let's see. Stephen, Stefan Jones, very good. Yes, and this is right. Okay, so let's get to the topic for tonight. If you saw the, the intro, that was, I, I rate some trials that I get involved in when I've been covering trials, and I guess I've been covering about five trials at this point. Um, I rate the prosecutors and the judges and the defense attorneys, and I think that this, whoops, there we go. This lady here, uh, Sue, Sue Oper, is excellent, excellent, best prosecutor team I've seen on the internet, best trial conducted. And we're going to talk about why, but the Daryl Brooks trial. There was also a very good prosecutor over in Tampa who, um, who did the Matthew Terry trial, which was, uh, there was a stabbing, it was a death penalty trial, and they did an excellent job as prosecutor. I, I had it was just a little bit of holdback, a little bit of cheating at the penalty phase that I just had to take a letter grade off. I hate to say I do not tolerate unethical cheating. And it was it was a little slimy and they gave that defense something to hammer on, you know. So here's the first point that I want to make. And I used to train prosecutors and now I train defense attorneys, but I'm an equal. I want to see I want us all to be the best that we can be. And that includes my prosecutor side on the other side, right? And the judges, I want the judges to be, I want the team to be great. I want everybody to be great. So this, the prosecutor's teams, let's talk about how they can do it great. And one of the things that a prosecutor can do, and they maybe they don't know this, maybe they don't get taught this, I don't know. But a good prosecutor can keep a defense attorney in their chair. What I mean is, don't give them the opportunity to object. If you do a clean trial, the system will grind those people. The system will convict the guilty. Have a little bit of trust that the system is designed. The system is very pro-state already. And you don't need to cheat to win. Thus, you will win most of your cases anyways because the system is designed. Most cops that I've dealt with are very honest. I, I know that we we pick on some of the bad cops and some of the bad things we see in there and the internet. But I mean, a lot of the police officers are very honest and hardworking folks. Most of them are. And you can lay the case out for the jury and let the jury decide. This cheating thing is tremendously destructive for our for our system, cheating by prosecutors. Now, defense attorneys, your job is to zealously advocate for your client within the rules. That's the thing. And I've seen there's a lot of different styles. And one of the nice things about being a defense attorney is you can be, you can be pretty outrageous. You can be crazy. You can be creative. You can be yourself and argue to a jury and craft things. It's very, um, very good, right? That's fun as far as lawyering goes. But with a prosecutor, you have to be the best in the face of even unethical opposition. It's, it's hard, or let me, let me see if I can restate this. The defense attorney's job is to zealously advocate for their client. The prosecutor's job is not to win at all costs. Their job is to uphold the law. You uphold the law by following the law. You uphold the law by following the ethical guidelines, 
you are conservative with what you say. You present your case very methodically. There's a very methodical way, which I have laid out. We're going to go through this on how to present a case. It's I call it paint by numbers. It is a bit paint by numbers. There, It is very methodical. It is very systematic, um, the way that a prosecutor should present their case. And if you have a case to present, the paint by numbers approach, the way that I'm going to teach here to you tonight, is will work every time. If it does not, there's a problem with the case that needs to be addressed. And you need to be understand the system, you understand the trial that you're going to present. And whoops, click the screen there. Um, so this is this is what uh yeah, the prosecutor, here's a good example. Karen, you know, prosecutors should not be invested. They should not make comments under their breath. That's annoying. A very good. You need to be self-disciplined. Self-discipline as a prosecutor. It's tough. I understand. It gets very warfare-like. I'm one of my buddies. When I was prosecuting, one of my buddies was the public defender on the other side. We had we would work most stuff out, but occasionally we'd have a trial. We'd dis disagree on the law or the facts. And that's what it should be. It should be agreement, disagreements over law and facts. That's what you're arguing about. Um, or length of sentence. That's oftentimes the thing. But if it's length of sentence, it's like, oh, plea straight up to the judge and you've got a second opinion. If you don't like my offer, you can plea and argue what you want to the judge. I, I don't, I'm not invested in that sentencing decision. Um, se second thing, and yes, nowadays, not all prosecutors are ethical. And sadly, watching these trials, and I, I'm shocked, about half of them that I've seen on that I've covered, which is, you know, a small sample out of six. I understand about six trials I've covered. About half of them are bad. And, and that's not acceptable. That's not an acceptable rate for prosecutors. So I'm going to teach tonight how to do it right so that you know how to do it going forward, right? So I got distracted. There was another point. I should go back and watch myself. <laughs> the the um, prosecutor needs to be careful how they present their case and in the in the face of instigation, maintain the dignity of the law, maintain the dignity of the state. Let the other side be crazy. Let the other side be confusing. Your job is to be clear, focus the jury on the issues, focus them on the elements, and talk about law and facts. Oh, I was telling you about the story about my buddy in um up in Flagler, who was in the public defender's office. So we would some we'd work out most of the cases, but occasionally we wouldn't. And when we did not work out a case, we we would call it a war day. <laughs> and we were friends, right? So I would say, you know, he is my friend. I, I liked him. I respected him. He's a good guy. But what, when we just didn't agree, we would agree when we would like, we would not go to lunch on war days. That means when we were in trial together, that was a war day. And I didn't expect any kind of benefit or grace or any quarter given by the defense attorney. I'm not like, come on, stipulate to this thing. I mean, or let me bring this evidence in, you know, wink, wink, nod, nod. I mean, there was no, I expected him to zealously advocate for his client and make me prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And that was my expectation. And I'm not going to, he's not going to ask me for any favors. And I'm not asking for him for any favors, even though we're friends and we have a good relationship. That's not what the game is because at trial, now we're at war and your job is to zealously advocate. And my job is to prove, you know, prove the case with admissible evidence. And that goes with admissible evidence. So one of the ways that a prosecutor upholds the law is by not using inadmissible evidence, not cheating, sneaking it in. Um, these, this goes, let, we should go into the essay. And so if you want to look at this essay, go to um, SSRN and, and you can find this essay. Let me share, um, we'll present screen and we'll go. Yeah, Shane, you know it's out of the first book, right? Yeah, you can go to the you can go to the um okay, here it is. Okay, so here is the um the article. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, good. Blow it up a little bit. I like it nice and big. All right. Got that? Yes. So this is the essay is actually it's actually a three-parter. Um, this is quite a a lengthy essay, um, and, and it's called Trial Techniques for a Florida Prosecutor, a Positive Prescription for Ethical Closing Arguments. The first part of that, this, which is what we will discuss tonight, was part of, a, was a refinement of a training document that I use to train prosecutors in our 
when I was prosecuting. I would train, like I train our public defenders, I would train prosecutors, and I had a document that I would do. So when I created this essay, I thought it important because I criticize, I, it's a, this essay here is, there's the second part is about all the closing argument problems that can be done by prosecutors. Um, and it's a guidebook for defense attorneys to use to challenge closing arguments by prosecutors when they're out of line. But I said, okay, it's not enough to criticize. Remember, it's ideas and answers in law, ideas and answers in law. The answers part is, okay, fine, you can criticize, but what is the right way to do it? And thus, I start my little essay here. The first thing is, is thou shalt not, writes the appellate court. So when you read these appellate decisions, it's all the stuff, somebody messed up, this is wrong. And so they're always saying, okay, there's a million ways that people do things wrong, but what's the right way to do it? What is the, that's why it's a positive prescription. So how do you do it right? So let's, let's talk about it. Now, first of all, prosecutors have unique ethical duties. And I studied this and I'm a big believer in this. There's, um, there's a lot of guidelines here that, um, and that is the law is a for, well, this is from Bastide, which is, uh, he has a, um, the law, which is here, Frederick Bastide. Uh, the law is a common force organized to prevent injustice. It's a lot of, what is the law? It's a very strange concept. There's whole classes on this, right? So, Yeah, and it's tempting to think of the job of the prosecutor as simple if you view it as the role of presenting evidence to a jury or maintaining acceptable throughput of files. But to do the job correctly, a prosecutor must be aware of her proper role within the criminal justice system and be able to fulfill that role. A much more difficult prospect. A prosecutor should seek the truth as well as an equitable solution for all interested parties. The prosecutor must balance the interests of law enforcement, the victims of a crime, the elected state attorney's office policies, the society as a whole, and even the defendant who is also a citizen of the state. So by respecting constitutional rights in the courtroom of the defendant, the, the prosecutor is fulfilling their job as a defender of the role, a defender of the law. So now a lawyer owes a duty to the client. For a defense attorney, that's easy, right? The client is the accused of the crime. They sit next to the lawyer, but the prosecutor represents the state. Now, the first thing is, let's be clear on that. The state is not the prosecutor's ego. The prosecutor represents the state. The state is not the prosecutor. The prosecutor is the lawyer for the state. The, they have a client also, and the defendant is a citizen of the state, the victims of the crime are citizens of the state, law enforcement, state attorney's office. And the state is the, is the law, is the people. Their job is to uphold the law. So, and it's a difficult role. It requires the prosecutor to suborn his or her own ego, as well as individual desires of goals to the larger and greater ideal of justice. So I remember one of my great uh, trainer guys was named Steve Nelson. He was the prosecutor's office. He was my supervisor when I was prosecuting. And he was an excellent, excellent lawyer. And um, I remember one time when I was first starting prosecuting and and I had lost a case. And I come in, I was kind of shaking my head. I'm like, oh, um, I was disappointed. And I said, I, lo I lost this case. And I remember Nelson, he was so great. He says, well, did you get all the evidence in? You thought you should have got in? I was like, yes. And did the jury consider it? Yes. And and did uh, did you um, did you you know get overruled or anything? The jury got to make the decision. Yes. Well, then you did your job. The jury made its decision. I know I wasn't surprised by anything the defense did. I I got all the evidence in. I thought I should do, and the prosecutor made their job. So, um, I love that. That was Nelson was awesome. And the duty does not dissipate because you've got a jury trial. Prosecutor must at all times operate in a fair and even-handed way. Now, this isn't just me talking. All right, this is this is so this sounds right. The prosecutor's duties requires honoring a defendant's right to a fair trial. Now, all of this whole paragraph, see, there's footnotes. There's a four, there's a five, there's a six. 
there's an eight. You see these seven here? See these footnotes? Let's go look at what the footnotes are. This is the national prosecution standards from the National District Attorneys Association. Here's the model rules of professional conduct, preamble and scope. Here's the criminal justice standards for the defense function for the American Bar Association, National District Attorneys Association, principles of federal prosecution, U.S. Department of Justice. All right, so this, this paragraph here that sounds so idealistic it is idealistic, but it's not Gosney. It's not Mr. Anti-Prosecutor, Mr. Defense Attorney. Absolutely not. This is from the prosecutors themselves of the standards that they hold themselves to and should. So this is this is an idea. This is the way it should work. It is not me. This is the way it should work. Any if you disagree with this, you you are disagreeing with the prosecutors themselves. It's not like, well, Ghazi's some pro-defense lawyer and he's this sort of, no, this is from the prosecutors themselves. Um, yes, here's a good one. Um, Bronca said a multiple one, justice is the process, not the outcome. That's true. And if I had a little discussion with somebody on one of these chat boards, I, I, I shouldn't read these chats, but when I when I go on Ricada's stream and I see these people commenting, um, it, it I do, I do see them, what they're saying, and I interact with them like, well, I don't think you're right on that. And one person, I used the example of the um, the kid who was uh, killed, you know, was um, executed in 1944. He was a 14-year-old boy who was executed by the state in 1944, and they were saying, oh, that guy did it. So he deserved the death penalty. I'm like, well, first of all, the kid was 14. Second, he was denied access not only to his parents, but lawyers. He was executed within months of the crime. He he his defense lawyer had a, had a complete conflict of interest. There was the, the venue should have been changed. It was an all white jury convicting a black kid of of a homicide of two white children. It was a really a miscarriage of justice. So it's like well, but he did it, so it's okay. The process is justice. What you were saying there is exactly right. Justice is the process, not the outcome. You cannot have justice with an unfair process. That is not justice. So to somebody to say to defend the death penalty in that system, in that scope, to me, they, they're very confused and they need to read death penalty debates. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, back to our little, uh, let's see here, back to here. Weighing the dangers is not a simple job. It requires wisdom, sensitivity, and deliberation. See that? Maintaining high ethical standards should be an absolute minimum for all prosecutors. So it's e this paint by numbers approach, what I'm talking about, the way you do a trial, it's, it seems boring. It's very methodical. It's very clear. It's very um, to the point. That's the easy part. The hard part is all of these other decisions. The prosecutor duty can be very difficult. It's a very hard, high bar, and you have to make sure you're fully conscious of your biases, what you're doing, are you dispensing justice, always questioning what you're doing, being very careful and methodical. Now, Robert Justice Robert H. Jackson, who I love, he's one of my favorite Supreme Court justices. Um, he, this is what he says, and this is very well well uh, quoted. The qualities of a good prosecutor as are as elusive and as impossible to define as those that mark a gentleman, and those who need to be told would not understand it anyway. A sensitiveness to fair play and sportsmanship is perhaps the best protection against the abuse of power, and the citizen's safety lies in the prosecutor who tempers zeal with human kindness, who seeks truth and not victims, who serves the law and not factional purposes, and who approaches his task with humility. That is the great Justice Robert H. Jackson, who's one of our greatest Supreme Court justices, and he's very he, he was always good with clear-minded and clear writing, which is something I strive to do also. Um, hey, good to see you, Ronan. Been a while. Or happy belated Easter. Um, yes, minor, and this is minors do, are not executed. The case law is clear on that. Um, no longer are minors executed. It's it's reserved only for us lucky people over 18. <laughs> um, let's see. 
Okay, now and then I talk about the Florida rules of professional conduct here. The prosecutor is an independent administrator of justice. The primary responsibility of a prosecutor is to seek justice, which can only be achieved by the representation and presentation of the truth. This responsibility includes, but is not limited to, ensuring that the guilty are held accountable and that the innocent are protected from unwarranted harm and that the rights of all participants, particularly victims of crime, are respected. Okay, that's in Florida. Okay, and so here, this this there's this article talks about closing arguments and specifically, but um, improper closing arguments by prosecutors remain a chronic problem in Florida. Using disallowed arguments in a closing argument is a betrayal of a prosecutor's duty to justice. So here's another great great Supreme Court uh, quote that is often used. Hey, upon the horizon just showed up. Good to see you. What was the woe about? <laughs> the pro the uh, Lady Law Sandra, hi, how are you? Good to see you. Um, the prosecutor is the representative of not the of an ordinary party to a controversy, but to a sovereignty whose obligation to govern impartially is as compelling as its obligation to govern at all, and whose interest, therefore, is a criminal prosecution is not that it shall win a case, but that justice shall be done. As such, he is in a particular and very definite sense the servant of the law, the twofold aim of which is that the guilt shall not escape or innocent suffer. He may prosecute with earnestness and vigor indeed, he should do so. But while he may strike hard blows, he may not at liberty to he is not at liberty to strike foul ones. It is much his duty to refrain from improper methods calculated to produce a wrongful conviction as it is to use every legitimate means to bring about just one. I would take out the word wrongful here. It's your duty to refrain from improper methods, period. doesn't matter why you're doing it. If you think the guy's guilty, then it's okay. Not good. Okay. Um, so here's Justice Harris. Fifth District Court of Appeals, which is my court. An unfair verdict based on an unethical lawyer can conduct does not merely injure the unfortunate party suffering a loss. It injures every lawyer, every judge, and the very foundation of our profession. It diminishes our credibility. We as courts lessen the value of our product, a fair trial for everyone, when we permit an unfair result, knowing that the product of unethical conduct of one of our supervision and one who has sworn to abide by the rules. So, okay, so that's a, that's a setup, right? We've set up what the prosecutor should be, right? My question, okay, so the question is, okay, fine, this is all what you should do, but how do you do a jury trial? All right, so Mark point here, we're at 838. Boy, I see if time flies when you're having fun. We're going to get into part two, basic framework of a criminal trial. So here's how to do it. For all of you prosecutors out there, I want you to be your best. As a defense attorney, I want you to be your best. I want you to perform your function correctly. So how do you do it? All right, you have an opening statement. This is the structure of a trial. And that is a simple factual summary of the case, anticipating what the jury will hear. And oftentimes you use a chronological statement, buttressed by a theme, buttressed by a theme. It should begin with a simple introduction followed by an overview of the evidence in story form. So tell a story about what they're about to hear. So you have a theme. So you might come up with something like um, an, you know, an admission. Oftentimes a prosecutor will begin their statement. Ladies and gentlemen, the jury, judge, your honor. You'd say, um, and then you say something like, I had to get rid of him. I had to get rid of him. That are the words from the defendant, the person who is accused of this horrific crime. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Steve Gosney. I represent the state of Florida. And today and tomorrow, we expect you to hear from this witness stand the following narrative. Okay, and so then you would tell the story. 
late one night on a March 15th of 2024. There was, it was a uh, Saturday night. People were putting their kids to bed when a knock entered the door and tell it in a story, dramatic fashion. If you get objections, this is all opening statements. Now it's a statement. It's not an argument. So you just say, so if you get an objection, you go back to, okay, the state expects the evidence to show. Now you can leave that, 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 that preface off and just say it. But if somebody objects, we just say the state expects the evidence to show. Your, your story should begin with that because that means that you're talking facts and not argument. And then you say, and then you repeat the theme. At the end of the story, you repeat the theme and then say something like, after hearing all the evidence and instructions, the evidence will convince you the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Simple. You're telling a story. What you're doing is you're introducing yourself. You're expect, You're producing an expectation of what they will hear from the witness stand. And you are laying out the story that they're about to hear. So then the jury has heard the story once after your opening statement. It's not argument. Then you get the case in chief. Now, there's a witness, then there's a an witness order question. And this is where the state has its fun. You get your witnesses lined up and you get them to tell the story of what you just said. Usually you start with your banger witness. You start with your strongest witness or your second strongest. So that you the, the, the first and last witnesses are usually your first strongest and your second strongest witnesses. Some people put their second strongest first. Some people um, put their second strongest last. Uh, it depends on the case. You want to see how they how they go, but you want to. I like to have the narrative told as much as I can up front and have it the story that you just told repeated from the witness stand as closely as possible on your first witness, so that they they get it a second time from the witness stand, right? So you lay it out in a, and sometimes you do chronological order, right? It is like a batting lineup. Very good. That's right, Ronan. And this is another thing. The lead witness is the best witness. And one of the things that can be done, and you should, and a prosecutor needs to subvert their ego. It's not about them. It's not about I'm the lawyer and I'm going to win this. It's about the people that were there. The witnesses to the party should be telling the story. Get your ego out of it. And I, I love narrative, asking for narratives from witnesses until the defense shuts me down. Because you can get very efficient by saying, Detective Johnson, would you tell the jury what you saw that night? And they'll say, you know, they'll, well, my police report on March 15th, 2024, I responded to a call at the 24th. You can get all kinds of root details in that don't really matter, that aren't evidence of the, that aren't really the essential where the case is going to turn. You can get that narrative out in a narrative from the jury. If the defense says objection, asking for a narrative, then you can go and you can break it down step by step. But a lot of times these kind of, preliminary factoids that set the scene, you can get in a narrative form and it's being told from the witness stand from somebody other than yourself, the prosecutor, right? Um, very important is to let the witnesses tell it. A lot of these yes, no questions, like, you know, you got to control the witness and you got to lead them by the nose and tell them what to say. That is absolutely out as far as I'm concerned. Now, unless it's a difficult witness, a hostile witness, then you have to do that. Or if the, you know, you're getting a lot of objections and you know your judge, but generally you want the witness to tell the story. So tell, tell the jury what happened next and what did you see? What did you hear? What did you observe? What did the defendant tell you? Those kind of asking those up, tell, please tell the jury what you saw when you arrived home. What did you hear when you approached the area? If they're, if they're just saying, if you put yourself in the chair and you become the spotlight, look at me, it's about me, you know, isn't it true, Mr. Defense Attorney or Mr. Uh, Detective, that the defendant admitted to you that he came out? Like, yes. And isn't it true that you went up to the thing and did this and you heard, you smelled the smell of smoke? Isn't that true? Yes. And didn't you, when you approached the other person, oh, and then so I got all things. So you're doing all the testifying. And I know that the, there's some people that say that's, you know, you're controlling the courtroom. I say the opposite. I say that you are being an egotist and you're putting yourself in the in the witness chain. The, 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 when the instructions themselves, in the Florida jury instructions, they say you are to consider the evidence that comes from the witness stand. So let the witnesses tell it. 
as best you can. Okay. Yeah, who, what, when, how, where, those are all those appropriate and ethical kind of questions, right? You're getting facts. And this is what I would instruct my police officers to do too, is not to narrate, to say, to say, what did you see? Who did you, who said it? Why did, you know, why did you take an action that you took? When did this happen? What did you smell? Oh, Harriet, good to see you. Just popped in cooking homemade veggie soup. Tell you I started your book and it's great. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for not judging it by its cover. <laughs> Funny. Okay, let's see. Um, this is a prosecutor thing. This is, we're talking prosecutors. This is, I'm, I'm putting my prosecutor hat here and training prosecutors right now. The middle witness is usually, then you start going into chronology. So usually you might put the lead detective on first that can give you the overall narrative of the case. And then you go through it step by step by step, building your case up, building the case up. Um, thank you, Slidey Pie. Slidey Pie, order desires. Yes, I will sign your book. You're wonderful. Um, you love the cover? Thank you. I think I think the cover is great too. You know, I'm not easily offended. <laughs> okay, where are we? Oh, we got to get going here. Last witness is the second best witness. You can change those. It depends on your order. And this is something you talk about with a prosecutor team. Um, and there's a whole background. I actually teach trial attorneys. This is just a little tidbit. I teach trial attorneys. There's a, on how to really do this. There's something called a trial notebook. And it's very, um, a very complex of actually conducting this. I'm just trying to give an overview for you so that you understand what the right way to do these things is. Okay. Um, the last witness should be the second best witness. Um, and then now here, here's as a matter of practice, this is where I wanted to get. And this is what I call a trial notebook, which I develop for every trial that I do defense side, much, I'd say more extensively. I've, i maybe it's just that I'm older and I've done more, I've done more defense work now and I've gotten better and more sophisticated. But when I did the, in prosecutors too, in the prosecutor side, I would do the same thing. You'd have a master list of witnesses and evidence because that's all you have. You have witnesses and evidence and you have a list of all those witnesses. And I'd say, oh, here's a witness, Officer Johnson. And what is Officer Johnson going to say? He's, he want these five facts that that officer is going to teach or tell one, two, three, four, five. And you print it. I'd put it out on a piece of paper and put it in front of me. And I would I ask him to narrative, make sure the jury knows who he is. He explains himself. You get a little rapport. You hit those topics and you sit down. What is this witness expected to say? Get him to say it and sit down and shut up. Same thing with evidence. You have a checklist. Okay, there's the gun. There's the cartridges. There's the fingerprint analysis. There's the DNA kit. There's what else do I have? So here's a checklist of all of my evidence that I need to bring in. You put that checklist in and as you go through, make sure it's all in evidence and also that you have it lined up, that you have how to produce it. Into, you don't expect the defense. Now, you can stipulate ahead of time. A lot of times what you'll do is you'll stipulate to all the evidence before it comes in. It's all pre-marked and pre-admitted, which is great. But sometimes the ceremony of actually admitting the gun can be effective as far as introducing. You don't have to just stipulate to everything. Go through the exercise and make sure that you have a fallback plan. So if the defense changes its mind and objects, you don't get your nose out of joint. You've got you're ready to go and you can say, no problem. I'll admit it. And there's lots of techniques for that. But anyway, so the trial outline should note beside each witness, the key point of evidentiary value to which that witness is expected to testify. For example, the officer might be a witness to a statement, the accused or a link in a chain of custody might be both. And you want to make sure you get that witness to say it before. Oh boy, I've got I've got a story here, but I can't really tell it. Um, if I was teaching prosecutors in a class, I would tell the story. It's it's too personal, and the prosecutor would know I'm talking about him. But there was a really bad prosecutor who who completely blew a major major item of evidence. And the witness testified on the stand and completely I mean, never asked the question. 
and it sunk, sunk, sunk their case. A case that should have been a 20-year min-man turned out to be a three-year no-min-man case is ridiculous because they blew, they did not have their checklist in front of them and didn't know their case. Um, before each witness is excused, a prosecutor should check the master outline to make sure the testimony is properly in evidence. Prior to resting, you go through the checklist and make sure everything's in. So I, I would have a complete a master outline for every trial I do with all the witnesses, what they were expected to say, all the evidence, and then, and as it's admitted, before you rest, go through that checklist, make sure I've got everything in there and everything and everything's checked out and all the evidence that I want in is in. And also anticipating, anticipating, um, Oh, well, let me, anticipating what the defense may say. Okay, so Upon says, I don't know if he's working with, I am, I am still the provost and we've got plans maybe for fall. Uh, I don't know, but the, you can still take the classes. They are available. You can take them out of sequence. They're just not live, but yes, they're all recorded and please do sign up if you're interested in taking these classes. So I teach some of this stuff in uh, in Bronca's classes. So, um, Let's see what else we doing. Okay, so now the closing argument. So we've got all, now we've got so what's happened so far. Now let's think about our trial. We had our opening statement, and then we had the state's case in chief. Right, opening statement was a narrative of this telling the story of what just happened or what you're the expected to hear from the witness. Stand. Then the body, the main body of the case, will be the evidence being presented to the jury very methodically and chronologically from the witness stand, from the actual participants and the witnesses, along with the actual evidence. So now they're hearing the story in depth, in detail, at the second time during the trial. And that's the key evidence, right? Howdy, JW. Okay, so then we've got the closing. Now, one of the things, I, this doesn't anticipate defense, but you really should know what the defense is, or at least anticipate it and game it with people. With the, a lot of prosecutors don't have defense experience. They don't understand how defense attorneys work and what they're what they're doing, right, and how what the defenses are. I've talked about that in depth in other streams. But you, you as a prosecutor should anticipate that. And in fact, the trial theme, this is the basic framework of a prosecutorial trial. I would also recommend that if you anticipate a particular defense to focus your case on disproving that defense or proving beyond a reasonable doubt, overcoming that burden in the anticipated defense so that you've got that built into your case, that that it's like a strong, strong um, armor against attacks to the case in chief. Now let's talk closing arguments. So how do we structure? And this is a closing argument article, um, but this is this. Then now we're talking about the third time. Now I'll tell you another little secret. Don't tell anybody. I'm sharing with you, just you and folks that really want to be their best. If you're a prosecutor, I commend you for watching this, and I I encourage you to take notes. And I, but I'm not sure if this is for everybody. This is a little bit Gosney on this one. I would always. I, I would not write my closing arguments until the case was done. Okay, hear what I'm saying? I wouldn't write the closing argument until the case was done. Now, why is that? That's an interesting question. Because one of the things that I try to do in a trial is listen to the witnesses. And sometimes the witnesses will say and do things that if you aren't paying, if you're focused on commanding the courtroom and saying, asking all the questions, getting them to agree with you, you miss the moments that the jury is watching because the jury will be picking up on what the witnesses are saying. They're not, they're, they are going to formulate their opinion about you and it may be positive or negative, but they're focused on the evidence. So for you focus on the evidence. Sometimes you'll pick up on eye rolls and attitudes and disrespect and deceptive talk, all kinds of things that can come out in the way, maybe it doesn't conform to your little plan that you have written out that you expect that's going to come out. It comes out a little different and you've got a bob and weave. 
so then what you do is when you when you finished listening to all the evidence for yourself kind of for the first time now <coughs> retell the story and say your job is to observe the evidence and you saw you saw mrs uh mrs jones up on the stand you saw her demeanor you saw the way she reacted to that question that's some you know you're, you 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 can use your common sense to weigh her credibility was that the the mark of somebody who's credible or incredible because now you're you're focusing yeah we all saw that right we saw that you're you're pointing out something that everybody observed if you're all navel gazed and saying i'm commanding the court it's all about me you're going to miss those details so the closing argument is the opening statement was supported by the evidence as it should be the closing argument will be the third retelling of the narrative so you've got the, the opening the case in chief and now the closing is going to be a third retelling you then repeat the theme and this is why i don't write it because it's already written in my opening statement you repeat the theme you repeat the narrative and then you integrate the narrative with the factual support so I told you, you know, in opening statements, now you can say this in because you're in closing arguments. In opening opening statements, the state committed to you that you would hear that there was a, a witness to the shooting. And you heard Miss Jones get up on that stand and she told you what happened that night. She told you she saw the defendant pulling that firearm and fire shooting from that gun and the and the victim falling to the ground. You heard that evidence. You see, and so now you're connecting the narrative that her was come from the thing to the actual story. So as you retell the story, you're integrating it with the story that came from the, the witness stand. Okay. Um, the next is the jury instruction. So now you have in in when you add, get done with your when you start with your closing argument, you've just gone through your jury instructions. You should really do a jury instruction thing before it's a long another long portion that I teach, but. I get the jury instructions right in my hand and I say, here are the elements that we have to prove. And you can even chart it out, one, two, three, four. And here's all the evidence that goes to each element. Now, if it's say an identity question, you can focus on that. You know, nobody can, nobody's arguing that the victim is dead. Nobody is arguing that the person was murdered. The question is identity. So we're, you know, let's, let's check off murder. We check off firearm. We know all these things happen. The question is, did the defendant do it? Well. You heard from Mrs. Jones, who knew this kid from a boy, and she saw him with a firearm. Okay, and then we have the firearm, and that firearm was purchased by his girlfriend, and it was found at the scene, and his fingerprints on the trigger. Blah, blah, blah. You know, you talk about all the evidence that connects. Is there is there really any reasonable doubt? It's not beyond any every doubt. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. And any theory that would say that it would be somebody else is unreasonable. I submit to you that the defendant committed this crime. That's the only issue in this case, and it's way beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's the kind of thing you can say, right? Um, so you, you integrate the jury instructions. Now, something here, this is, a, this is another little tip. These are little tips, and I'm giving you a lot of tips, but you can read the article. It's in the Ideas and Answers in Law. This, this, this is just the first third of this total article, but... Um, Another thing that I would do is separate out sections of the closing argument by body position. So you would repeat the theme, repeat the opening statement, and then move away from the podium if the judge allows it. Move away so that just it doesn't have to be towards the jury. It can be a neutral move. But what it does is it's almost like setting, you know, hitting a return on the typewriter or hitting an enter and putting a space between the paragraph. It breaks it up. Okay, we're done with the narrative. Now I'm going to move over to this section, and I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to tell you about the jury instructions. And then you can go back when you're talking. So you can move back and forth to kind of punctuate your closing. I love closings, by the way. This is my favorite things. <laughs> punctuate with body position. Um I have stories here, but I will I will not repeat them because this is just a short little stream. And then you can always say that the prosecutor says, the jury, you are the fact finder here. This is the law, and your job is to properly find. You know, these are the facts that you have to find, not something else, just these elements. 
and then assessing credibility questions. Repeat your theme, answer in the affirmative, anticipate the defense, answer that challenge, and then ask the jury to come back for a finding of guilt. See, it's very, it's kind of um, paint by numbers here, right? It's very straightforward, very straightforward. Um, and then I talk about defense closings. Oh, well, this is this is helpful. So if for any prosecutors who don't know, if, uh, you know, that don't know um, defense, there's always, there's five defenses. <laughs> this is, this is, I love this. And I forget where I found it, but it's wonderful. There's always a defense. You'll say, how can you defend people who are guilty? I heard how many times, it's such a cliche question, but there's always at least one of these defenses. Okay, what is it? Well, the first is the event that gave rise to the prosecution did not happen. It wasn't a robbery. It was a sale. And the guy got upset because he didn't like the price. So now he turned it into a, so it didn't happen. The event that gave rise, the event that gave rise to the prosecution happened, but it was not a crime. Sure, they sold, they they had a hand-to-hand -hand transaction, but he was buying bubble gum, not, not crack or whatever, right? Um the event that gave rise to the prosecution happened, and it was a crime, but somebody else did it. There's the identity question. The event that gave rise to the prosecution happened, and it would be a crime, but there's a recognized affirmative defense. That's like, my guy was insane. He was operating in self-defense. Or the state cannot prove it. So, you know, you know when um, I, you've always got, as a public defender, you've always got the evidence is not to be believed. It's insufficient. And, and that's a very, I mean, the burden of proof is not to be neglected. I, you know, that's the go-to starter defense for every defendant. The state has the beyond the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. So they always have that defense. So a good prosecutor should focus on which defense is being posited during closing argument. So even have this little list and figure out which one the defense, which defense attorney is going for, and then rebut that in closing. So this is a little advocation for, um, and then a rebuttal. Yeah, and a lot, prosecutors don't know how to do rebuttal closing arguments, right? It's often flat and just a recitation, and then or it's a yes he did. That it's it's terrible. I tell you, I've seen so many bad rebuttals, and most of the really bad closing errors by prosecutors come at the rebuttal closing because they get all fired up because the defense attorney is denying they did it and they're so convinced and they're bought into their narrative of the case and they get upset. The defense attorney is disagreeing with them and they get up there and they got to pound the desk and, rah, and they get all fired up. And so it's very bad. Um, so instead, determine what defense the opposing counsel relied on and counter that defense directly with positive argument based on the evidence. And to rebut attacks on witness credibility, Use the weighing the evidence instruction and read that and say, well, the defense says you shouldn't believe, but let's go through the how you should assess this. Yeah, often get into trouble. And, you know, there's a lot of a lot of problems here. I, I, I have a longer course. Like I said, I, I would teach this. I teach defense attorneys this and I teach prosecutors this. Or I did. I used to. And I, I like teaching this because it's very important. We really need. We really need the best out of our prosecutors, and it comes from good training and good leadership, and that's what I tried to do when I was a prosecutor. Over-talking a strong case can blur the focus of a prosecution. Chaos and confusion are allies of the defense. The goal should be precision and clarity. And I love this. So let's, let's end this with... Um, Robert Jackson, my one of my favorite Supreme Court justices, recognized the ephemeral quest for perfection. I love this. Um, as a solicitor general, I made three arguments for every case. <laughs> First came the one that I planned, as I thought, logical, coherent, and complete. Second was the one I'd actually presented, interrupted, incoherent, disjointed, <laughs> disappointing. And the third was an utterly devastating argument that I thought of after that, after going to bed that night. I love that. That's so wonderful. Um, so that's that's uh, how to present a case as a prosecutor. What do you think, my friends? Uh, I really, I wrote this because I want prosecutors to be their best. It's funny that that last quote kills me because I remember one of the best defenses, one of the best closings I ever did. Um, 
it's a case that I actually took to the U.S. Supreme Court. It was uh, two felonies. And, uh, you know, this is I, I fought that one so hard. It was such a wrongful prosecution. I fought, fought, fought. I had pretrial motions and I had four four dismissal motions and special jury instructions and on two third degree felonies. I mean, I was just killing it. And the, the jury came back with one second degree misdemeanor. So it was a big win for my client. You know, he got six months probation, which is, you know, and he was facing he could have been a convicted felon, two felonies. But I didn't even like the conviction on the misdemeanor. So I took the misdemeanor all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Of course, they didn't accept my cert petition. But um, in that case, uh, what was it? What was I going to tell you about that one? Because it was. Um, oh, I, I, I remember one, somebody, one of my fellow defense attorneys watched my closing and she actually became a judge. And she told me afterwards, she said, that was the best closing I've ever seen. I was like, wow, you know, some of these, I wish you could see me, my trial stuff because I, I haven't done trials in so long and it's not on video, but I was really happy with that, that thing. And when I did the, and I did the appeal on it, right? So I got the appeal and I'm, I was so excited to read my crushing closing argument that this honorable defense attorney complimented me on. And so I was like, wow, I can't wait to, to read this. When I read it, it was absolutely incoherent. <laughs> I, I'd say because I talk with my hands, I talk with body motion, I, I use uh, em emphasis, I use volume, I, I use every technique I can to communicate. And uh, and it, when I read it back in a transcript, boy, my my words were just I just thought utterly incoherent. So it was funny. Um, oh, Shane, yes, I, there are U.S. or Florida Supreme Court. You've seen Florida Supreme Court oral arguments and some fifth DCA oral arguments. Okay, you've stuck with me this long. I'm gonna give you a little tidbit. All right, little tidbit, just, just because you stuck up and it's 907, we're gonna, we gotta go find our, uh, let, uh, let me, I'll tell you in a second, ask me my tidbit. I'm gonna go find who we're gonna redirect to. Uh, and we can maybe vote on it. Um, oh, experts doing trivia. I, I don't like his trivia. Um, Digger 420 on Bill Cooper. Well, that's that's like who who's streaming here that we can go over to. Um, the UI guy plus the umbrella guy, Shizzy Wiznut fails. Maybe I'll just let you guys do it. Nobody loves me. <laughs> uh, I don't see. Um, well, I'll just let you decide. Well, here's my here's my little bit of news. A little bit of news is that my U.S. Supreme Court cert petition, okay, so is uh, the one on the cost of incarceration. So if y'all are interested in this kind of stuff, Ideas and Answers in Law, my first book, has this part, this essay in it about the prosecutor, how to do a proper um, argument for prosecutors. And amongst other, there's also an article in here about the $50 a day cost of incarceration that Florida has passed, the Florida law, right? And I have petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court. The, the, the document in here is basically from the U.S. Supreme Court cert petition. And of course, the state, when they get the cert petitions, there's thousands and thousands that go up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they only accept one out of 3,000 cert petitions. So very, very rare do they accept something. So the state files a basically a notice saying they're not going to answer the my cert petition unless ordered to by the court. And that's the U.S. Supreme Court. So um, so I filed my cert petition, one in 3,000, we'll see. And then I saw recently that it was distributed to the justices. So the, you know, old Justice Thomas is up there reading my brief, I hope, I hope for me, probably his clerk, but I like to think it's the justices themselves and they vote off in it, right? So here's the bit of news. Today I go into work, looks like they've ordered the state to respond to my cert petition. <laughs> so I've advanced the chess piece one space forward. So that's pretty cool. The justices of Supreme Court said, you know, Ghazi might have something here with his. We're ordering the state to file a responsive brief. So thumbs up on, on Ghazi, that would be great. So you'll you'll see, this is, this is from the beginning, middle to end, you will see the whole journey. If I can go up there, and I would love to argue for the U.S. Supreme Court. You know, Clarence, what's, what's up, Clarence? Good to see you. A big fan, big fan. Um, I'd hang with with Clarence Thomas for sure. <laughs> Nicest guy in the court. I love I love that guy. He, read his autobiography. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? And we did a stream on that 
on that issue, if you remember a few a while back. If not, you can go back and read it. So with that, um, oh, so upon the horizon, before we let you go here, um, what was it? Um, upon the horizon, this book is amazing, humbling to read. Which one was that? Uh, anyway, I don't know. Hey, it was fun. Good night. It's uh, 9, 10. Go and uh, redirect yourselves at your leisure. And and God bless you all. And do your best and be a good example for others. Encourage your your brethren. And, and good, good time. Bye-bye.